The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and good morning if you are joining us from the West Coast today. We are covering GSA schedules in a complimentary webinar series with some great uh, perspective from our uh, very strong panelists. We've got uh, Archie Zamihan from GovSpend, Jim Bender from ZK Development, Karen Long from Streamline Government Contracts, and this is Jennifer Schaus. We are coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. You guys can see the topics that we're going to cover today in four sessions. Uh, the sessions are uh, 30 minutes each, about uh, uh, 20 or so minutes for uh, content, and then Q&A. You can type your questions in the panel box on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll uh, read off the questions in the order that they are received. Uh, today's webinar is complimentary. It is also recorded, so you can find the recording, um, we'll say by like 6 or 7 o'clock tonight, uh, could be earlier on our website under the section called webinars, and then scroll down to the section called GSA schedules, and this webinar will be listed at the top. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and move on um, into just some more of the details for each session. Archie Zamihan from GovSpend is gonna be discussing uh, how you can use data to determine if you need a GSA schedule. I'll follow her from 12.45 to uh, 1.25 p.m. on just the GSA schedule requirements and the proposal preparation process. Uh, Jim Bender will come in behind me talking about the marketing practice, best practices for the GSA schedule. And Karen Long uh, will close us out with compliance and reporting, uh, a very essential part of uh, the GSA schedule. That might take us a little bit uh, beyond 2.45. We might bleed into uh, 3 o'clock, uh, depending upon the questions that come in, but we're going to try to adhere to this schedule. Um, so again, just keep in mind that um, this is being recorded, so if you need to hop off, you can find the recording again on our website under the section called Webinars, and simply scroll down to the section under that called GSA Schedules. Okay, and a uh, quick blurb about us. We are based in Washington, D.C., and primarily are helping companies get onto the GSA schedule. Uh, we have over 570 um, free webinars on our YouTube channel covering a variety of topics on government contracting. We've covered every part of the FAR, every part of the DFARS, all of the FAR supplements, uh, all of the major department uh, profiles. We've done subcontracting on all of the departments and some of the agencies. Uh, we've also got uh, webinars focused just on GSA schedules. There's over 40 of those. Um, and that is where this recording again will be listed. So if you just go to that link that is the second from the bottom, you'll find today's recording there. Um, and then just a link to some of the other um, services there or actually the, uh, the GSA agency profile, their supplement, um, and additional information about GSA. Okay, uh, we would be uh, negligent if we did not mention we've got a networking event coming up on Monday, this coming Monday, over 200 tickets have been sold. We're gonna have nine federal agency slash departments there, including State Department, Department of Education, Department of Interior, HHS, the Army Corps of Engineers, NAV Air, uh, Naval Surface Warfare Center, the National Guard, and the Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority. Our sponsors include Amazon, First National Bank, Bio One, uh, Bidspeed, Proposal Helper, Spartan Shield, and Shaletta. We want to thank our sponsors as well as the nine um, government entities who are going to join us. You can buy tickets for that on our website under the section called Events. Okay, uh, GSA schedules top to bottom. Let's go ahead and get the uh, party started here. We're going to talk about using data to determine if you need this contract vehicle. And uh, Archie Zamihan from GovSpend, the floor is all yours. I'm going to mute myself and just let me know when you're ready for your next slide. And thanks again for joining us today. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Always nice to be here uh, with, with you in um, all the webinars that you do. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Archie Zamihan, and I'm the director of federal go-to-market at GovSpend and FedMine. Um, 
FedMine is a federal business intelligence tool that basically integrates the 18 federal data sets into one easy to use platform. We are now part of GovSpend, the leader in state, local and educational procurement data and now provide the best in federal and SLED information, uh, procurement information to our clients. So we are here to talk about GSA schedules top to bottom. I think it's an amazing webinar that Jennifer's put together. And I'm specifically going to talk about the data. So let's get to the next slide. So, sorry. So why is data important? Um, you know, I just thought it makes sense for me to talk a little bit about the importance of data. Uh, a lot of times we do not pay um, as much attention as we should. Um, so it's important because it truly helps us with making um, confident decision making. The da uh, data can provide a good, uh, helps guide our strategy. And when we have a strategy or a vision that's based on data, it sort of makes it a lot more easier for us to commit to. Um, it also allows us to be proactive and create the business opportunities that we want for our business. Uh, you know, and the other thing that I personally, I love data, um, is, is that it helps uh, provide us with that transparency and the objectivity that is needed in true decision making. Uh, in federal contracting, uh, we use the spend data to really understand uh, How's that? How is the how is the agency buying what you're selling? Uh, and is there an opportunity for you to sell within the federal government, within um, and within that specific agency? And so, next slide. So, when we are talking about um, you know, using data to grow within a federal agency. Uh, it, you know, we, we want to use the data to understand which agency is buying the solution, product, service that we're selling. We want to further understand within each agency, how are they buying? Um, are they buying on a specific schedule? Are they buying on a specific GWAC? Uh, you know, are, are those contracts going to small businesses or other than small businesses? Um, you know, what are the set asides? Uh, are they are they being are set asides being used? Uh, and how's the agency doing with regards to its own goals? Um, and we use all of this data to create those opportunities for ourselves. Um, you know, we we are looking not only at contracts that are expiring, but we're looking at the new requirements that are coming out. Uh, you know, we, we always want to be ahead of the curve, right? Uh, and then we also want to, you know, understand if we have an innovative solution, how do we want to sell that to the agencies that could use us? So data truly provides us with a lot of insight and helps us create a strategy. Um, we're going to focus more on, you know, using the existing data to understand if we need a GSA schedule. Um, I think it's also super important for us to always remember that a GSA schedule is a vehicle. It's a way for agencies. It's a vehicle that an agency can use as a contracting means. Um, and I know Jennifer is going to talk a lot more about that. But I think it's important for us to keep in mind that a GSA schedule is not a guarantee that you're going to get a contract. Uh, and, you know, all of us know um, how many clients and people we've spoken with who feel that a GSA schedule is going to be the answer to their problems. But it's just a vehicle. It's not a guarantee. Um, and once you get it, you really, really, really need to use it effectively. And I know that's what uh, Jim's gonna talk about in a bit. So uh, next slide. So of course, we're talking about data and I thought it's important to do an overview of all the contracts that have been obligated and then do another 
layer on how much has been awarded on schedules. Uh, you know, FY20 was the pandemic um, in federal contracting that year reached $686 million, billion dollars, sorry. Uh, these are fe federal contract awards that are made public, does not include grants um, or any other uh, contracts that are not made public. Uh, FY21, we have about $647 billion that were awarded. FY21, 22, as of last week, we are about at $629 billion. This number will definitely go up um, as uh, all the DOD data is made public. However, based on the data that we have uh, since FY21, approximately 10% of contracts are being awarded on GSA schedules. Uh, what is interesting and uh, to also note is that on of the contracts that were awarded on GSA schedules, about an average of about 46% went as small business contracts. Now, keep in mind when we say small business contracts, these are uh, contracts or awards or task orders where that contracting officer is the one making the decision if that specific award is a small is is made as a small business or not. Um, I also want to make sure that, you know, this is overall uh, results will vary by agency results will vary once you put in your keywords or you start filtering in uh, the, you know, the search even more. So next, next question. I mean, sorry, next slide. Uh, so uh, this is just another view of all the various schedules that have been used. So. Uh, keep in mind, I think it was pre-2019, um, you know, we had multiple award schedules. Uh, however, the GSA then made the decision to consolidate all the various schedules into one mass or multiple award schedule uh, to make life a little easier. However, uh, you know, the, it's taken time and I think, um, as you can see, you we yet see some awards on schedule 70s uh this is our historical data and it's slowly i think everything's just going to be on the mass schedule even when it comes to the type of reporting that we can do uh, the data that we get is coming from fbds uh, just so that everyone knows where our data that i'm presenting is coming from uh, and it's uh you know fedmine's uh, presentation uh, so the other thing that I always I want to bring to everyone's attention is that Oasis, Alliant, the 8A Stars, WETS are all uh, GVACs or government-wide acquisition contracts that fall under the GSA schedule. Um, and again, as you can see that it, historically, uh, definitely Schedule 70 has been one of the largest GSA schedules, but now it's all under the mass. Uh, schedules, but you can also see the contracts that are being awarded on OASIS and OASIS Small Business. Um, so, uh, next slide. So, I wanted to deep dive into uh, the mass schedule just a little bit. As you can see, in terms of agencies that are using the mass schedule, Health and Human Services, DOD, Homeland Security, GSA, of course. Are all and the Department of Veterans Affairs are the top five agencies. Um, and in terms of the NAICS codes uh, that are being used, a uh, lot of uh, administrative management consulting services and a lot of computer programming and computer related services. Um, so this is just one quick view. Of course, you know, we can get into more details, but just to show you, give you a quick overview of how agencies, which agencies are using the mass schedule. Um, next slide. That's a deep dive into uh, Schedule 70, which is now since into the mass, but this is all the historical information. And again, it's super interesting to, to see how, and we all know Schedule 70 was totally IT related, all custom programming services and and codes. 
Um, but in terms of agencies that used to use it, um, you know, definitely HHS and DOD, but also Homeland, uh, DOJ, and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I like the fact that we can yet go back in time, especially if you're in the IT um, industry, you can go back and see what was awarded on the Schedule 70 and sort of fine tune your searches just to see what could be coming up as you do expiring contract searches and things. So uh, I think it's nice to have that that historical data by schedule um, as you're getting more into the data piece. Um, next slide. Um, the next slide, we're sort of just going to look at deep dive into the OASIS program. And again, um, I find I found it pretty interesting that when we are looking at the OASIS program as a whole, the, the NAICS codes that are being used are a little different, uh, which is why we have all of these various GBACs. Um, and it does have quite a lot of R&D and engineering services. So uh, next slide, please. Um, the, you know, while, while these numbers are just overall the, the, the deep dives that we did, uh, keep in mind that uh, the, the numbers will definitely change if we start putting in keywords or any other type of filters. Uh, and that's really the type of detail that we really all want to get to. And we'll get into that in a couple of seconds. Um, the other thing that I found interesting and I wanted to share was also, uh, especially if you're a small business and you're trying to understand if you should get uh, a small, get, um, you know, um, uh, get a GSA schedule, it, it helps to also further look and see uh, especially when you're looking at awards less than a specific dollar threshold. And in this case, I'm just looking at awards less than 150,000. Um, you know, about uh, $1.1 uh, $1 billion were awarded in that threshold, and this was for last year. Um, and you could see that about almost 60% of those contracts went, went to small business. So again, um, as you're dissecting the data, uh, you know, putting in dollar thresholds also could give you a lot more transparency, um, you know, uh, that uh, transparency. So next slide. So I thought the best way to sort of uh, show how to use data is to do a couple of examples and case studies, uh, if you if you want to say that. Um, so. The first case study is, uh, you know, using cyber as a keyword. Uh, the company provides cyber solutions. Uh, I know it's super generic, uh, but, um, you know, yet it does give us some, some information. Uh, so in this case, uh, if I just want to look at awards that have been made where cyber is in the contract description, uh, you know, almost $2 billion were awarded in FY20. FY21, we are about 1.9, which will definitely, um, yep. And in FY22, we are at about 1.87, which will also increase, uh, you know, once the ninth, once December 31st comes. Um, this is the type of data that I would see. I would then sort of understand and look at the agencies that are winning these contracts, uh, or rather awarding these contracts and use this to see, uh, you know, which agencies should I be focusing on? Uh, you know, which, and that really will depend on your solution or product or service that you provide. Uh, what's your past performance, whether it's in a specific agency, um, you know, what are your existing relationships that might be there? Um, and then also, uh, is there, you might have an, a relationship through a teaming agreement. Um, so use this type of information to sort of go through the list of agencies as you're creating step one of your strategy. Um, and in this case, it, we're just saying, hey, let's see what's out there that I can, which agencies I should target. So let's go into step two, so the next slide which is using the same keywords, but now I'm saying I want to search just to, I want to understand what contracts have been awarded on GSA schedules. Um, 
are the various agencies using GSA schedules to award cyber keywords? Uh, you know, so in this case, when I do the search just for cyber in FY21, I am at about $218 million in contracts that have been awarded. It's almost an average of about 14%. Um, and then uh, in FY22 also, I'm at about $277 million. So again, this data clearly tells me that about almost 15% of contracts are being awarded on GSA schedules. And it sort of helps me understand, yes, I think I need to get a schedule, but let's dig in more. Um, you know, this is where I'm gonna say, and, and, and use the data and say, okay, I have about $105 million that went on the mass schedule, 87 on the 70s, that's going to transfer, is already transferred into the mass schedule. So we are almost about $200 million on the mass schedule. Um, but you can also go in and see the contracts that are on 8A stars 2. And if you are on 8A stars 3, you know those could possibly come to, to you. Um, as also looking at contracts that might be on the various uh, OASIS type of schedules too. So, use this type of search to get into the next level of understanding the uh yes gsa schedules could be helpful and the next step will be which type of schedule and um you know this is where you might also say uh i think the agent i'm i might want to team with companies that are winning these contracts that might be on the oasis or the vets or the alliance type of contracts. Those are strategies that can then be created based on the data that's out there. Um, I also th think that, uh, you know, the next deep dive would be, uh, and that's the next slide, looking at a specific agency. So now we know that, and this is an assumption that we're doing that we, I uh, want to the solution that we have is best suited for the Department of Homeland Security. So we are now going to go in and do another filter of understanding within Homeland Security what type of schedules are being used and how is that agency awarding those contracts. So in this case, we actually could go in and see that uh, you know the mass schedule definitely is being used by. Homeland Security to award contracts uh, for cyber. A little bit work is also going on 8A Stars 2 as also the OSS small business. Um, and what I find interesting and we want to focus on is also that these contracts are going as small business. So uh, again, if you're a small business, definitely helps you understand further within an agency that you can sell or you're already selling to or have a relationship with. Um, they are using GSA schedules and they basically are awarding contracts as small business. Um, if you're not a small business, you might say, I need to understand who are the companies that already have a relationship and are winning contracts. So you would delve further into understanding, um, you know, one, not only what the requirement of that task order was, who's winning that contract, when is it expiring? And, um, you know, if, if you might just decide that, hey, this is where, I am happy with a teaming or a subcontracting relationship also. Um, also further understand as you're delving into an agency, understand if any set-asides were also used um, or if any of those contracts were awarded as sole sources. Um, so, and then, uh, you know, from here, my next um, step really would be, and the next slide, thank you, would be uh, understanding if there are any, you know, understanding what contracts could really be ex coming up in the next 12, 24 months. Um, you know, these contracts, uh, especially if it's a service or a solution, you want to remain ahead of the curve. Uh, so not only do we now know that there are contracts that are being uh, awarded in the agency on my GSA schedules, but my next step now is going to be when are those contracts expiring, you know, um, and does it now make even more sense for me to get on that schedule? Uh, this is just an example of uh, looking at 
contracts that are on the OASIS uh, that are expiring in the next 12 months. And you can see it's about uh, $15 million of contracts expiring. Um, so we, you know, again, you could say, yep, uh, I am, this is where I'm going to team up with any of these incumbents and um, move in further and, and see if I can um, uh, grow my business uh, using the GSA schedule. Uh, so just based on this specific cyber example, um, I think it is easy to feel that, yes, I definitely need to get a schedule. Uh, but as you go through the remaining presentations, um, there's so much that goes into keeping a, getting a schedule, but also keeping it, maintaining it, and making sure you're staying up to date. It ultimately does become a business decision uh, for a lot of companies, whether they want to have their own schedule or a lot of times they might just explore um, teaming arrangements. Um, so just keep that in, uh, you know, in the back of your mind. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, my next case study is super simple. Uh, in this case, I said, uh, you know, let's let's look at uh, a company sell style, uh, and I use that as my keyword. Uh, and you could see last uh, in FY21, about $43 million were awarded on um, by the federal government as awards. It fell to about $25 million in um, uh, 22. But what I found interesting was the fact that some contracts were awarded on uh, various schedules, uh, but it's truly not much. It's less than 5%. And it, this is where, again, it does get to be a business decision where you say, is the cost of maintaining a schedule, because there is a cost of maintaining the schedule, not only in, in terms of the fees and things that we pay, the IFF fees, but just the administrative cost that goes in. Um, and this is where you might decide that, no, I don't think I need a schedule uh, because it's not that big of a market that um, I'm going to get. So I want to make sure that I showed one case study of how you can use the schedule to uh, grow your business. And another one where a case is really a business decision, which could be, no, we don't want to get a schedule. Um, so let's let's get to the next slide i know i've put out you know i've talked a lot about data uh and how do you use it uh hopefully the two examples help us help clarify and give you some guidance on how you could use the data to decide if you need a gsa schedule or not um, but in my final slide i sort of wanted to talk a little bit about the best practices in data mining um, i think having accurate real-time data is very important. Uh, you know, the last thing you want is old data that's not not current. Uh, you know, uh, I'm always going to tell people, um, clients that do searches based on your core competency on your on the product or the solution that you provide. Um, I also feel and you know that using keywords and other filters, whether we look at NAICS or PSC or even GSA's categories, as you create your searches, will give you more clarity and visibility and transparency on whether you actually need a schedule or not. Um, and then, of course, save your searches, create searches, and use that, um, use your searches to, to get alerts. Um, and then um, use all the data that is out there to really um, create opportunities for your business. Uh, you know that that makes sense. Um, you know, uh, ultimately we all want to grow, and uh, but it it has to make best sense and best decision for your business. Um, and I think. Uh, that's it for me. Um, 
uh, I know you all, uh, you know, feel free, of course, I'm not sure if there are any questions, but. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Archiza. That was a great presentation and data obviously is the core of uh, how our decisions for strategy, uh, either getting onto the schedule or uh, who to market to and, and everything else um, obviously lies at the center of data. So we do have a couple um, questions that have come in. Um, just as a reminder, today's presentation is complimentary uh, and um, it is also being recorded. So you'll find the recording again on our website, jennifershouse.com. Go to the section called webinars and scroll down to the category called GSA schedules. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna read off these questions and I'll keep a, an eye on the clock as well. Um, okay, Archie, so the first one reads, are these numbers based on usaspending.gov data sets or other databases? Um, good, good question. Uh, we get our data from uh, FBDSNG. So we uh, have an atom feed that updates our data on a nightly basis. So uh, it's not US, uh, so the federal prime contract data comes from uh, um, FBDS. Um, via an atom feed and Great. you can find that yeah i think that was an easy one yep yep and for those that aren't aware fpds stands for federal procurement data system it's fpds.gov um you can conduct searches there um okay and the yep. next question I think uh, it, will this webinar cover instructions on how small businesses can obtain GSA schedule certification? Well, we're covering a variety of topics. Um, first and foremost, should you even get one? Um, so we'll go through the requirements in the next section. Um, can you please touch on the GSA springboard program for IT companies that don't meet the minimum revenue requirements for GSA schedule. Um, we can talk about that if we have time in the next section, which covers uh, requirements, unless Archisa, you have anything to add um, for that? I think that's, yeah. More I don't have any. Okay. Yeah. And the next question, will we get a copy of the slides of this training for future use? Yes, again, today's session is being recorded. You can find the recording on our website under the section called webinars. Scroll down to the category called GSA schedules. That'll take you to the YouTube channel uh, presentation. And then all of our uh, PowerPoints from every webinar we've ever done. So almost 600 PowerPoints can be found on slideshare.net. Uh, it's a free site, and you can log on to that slideshare.net using your LinkedIn uh, profile. Uh, can you explain Oasis Small Business? Yes, uh, it's uh, yep. You actually yeah, you have Oasis uh, uh, the the large. Uh, I think the OSS is broken up into many pools too. So you have the unrestricted or total OSS, and then you have the OSS small business, which is again further broken up into six pools, I think. And then you also have an OSS 8A uh, pool, and that's broken up into further small business pools. Great. And OASIS, just for clarity, uh, is a schedules program, we'll say managed by GSA. Uh, yes. Okay, next question is, are these screenshots um, captures from FedMine or in GovSpend? Uh, these are FedMine. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> and just so you guys know, FedMine um, was established in, what year did you say, Archiza? 2004. 2004 yes. and was sold during 2000 and... Last year, so 21. Year, so, yes, 20, so we want to go spend. Okay, great. Um, can you drill down to pricing and use it to build a pricing strategy around the next codes? Yes. yes. Okay. Totally. Great. Uh, what are some good databases to do deep dives on? Um, I, I know Jim's going to cover a couple of them. Of course, you have subscription services such as us, but then you have USA Spending. 
you could go to the authoritative federal data sets, whether you use USA spending, um, FBDS, SAM.gov, and I think GSA's got one too, D2D, I think, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you've got those databases too. Great. Uh, this is kind of a repeat, but what is OASIS? What tool did you use to get that data? Um, it's our tool. We pull information from FBDS NG, but then we also integrate uh, 17 other data sets. So it allows our clients to be able to filter results through pretty easily. So. Great. And again, FBDS is Federal Procurement Data System. NG is Next Generation. It's just the data warehouse actually managed by GSA um, of all the, the yeah. contract awards. Um, can you be a Canadian manufacturer and get a GSA schedule? I'll be happy to answer that, which kind of falls under requirements. Um, yes, as long as your products are uh, within the Trade Agreement Acts, that your products are TAA compliant. Um, Canada is a pretty safe bet. However, there are countries um, that are not on that list, and this is something that you should keep an eye on on a uh, regular cadence, whether it's monthly, quarterly. Um, so Iran, uh, North Korea, countries like this, Russia, um, uh, will not allow, uh, GSA will not allow these um, manufactured products onto the schedule. Okay, uh, is GSA schedule separate from SAM.gov? Um, SAM.gov is the registration system and it's slowly becoming the one source for all federal data. Uh, if you're talking about contract awards, uh, typically all contract awards go to FBDS, including any task orders that can be made public. Uh, awards will go to FBDS, I think, which feeds SAM.gov. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I'm hoping I am. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll just say um, SAM.gov is just your basic registration. It's as valuable as a uh, library card. It's not going to really get you much, but it's required uh, in order to do business with the government. But the government's not typically searching in SAM.gov for, uh, for vendors. It's just the, the basic step. Um, GSA schedules are a vendor shortlist, uh, not required. Uh, it's just one of many mechanisms that the government can use to purchase from you. Um, so yes, completely separate, two different animals, two different, uh, two different beasts. Okay, next question. Uh, and this might uh, be for Jim's section, so we can potentially uh, circle back to this. How does a teaming arrangement work with the flow of money? How long does it take to receive the payments? Does it come from the government or the teaming company? Uh, we'll save that. Um, a lot of new changes too, right? So, yeah. yeah. Okay, next question is, is there a pool in OASIS for SDVOSB, which is Service Disabled Veteran Owned Small Business? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so either. Mm -hmm. um, next question. There is you... going to be one pool on OASIS Plus, the new vehicle. There's going to be an SDVOSB contract on that one. Okay, thank you, Jen. That's the one that's current, current Okay, great. Uh, next question reads, how do you know if it's sole source? Um, it's some transactional details. Um, so when you get into a transactional detail, you'll find if it's a sole source or completed or what have you. Okay, great. And that, I think, takes us current here through the questions. Again, please uh, type your questions in on the right-hand side. We're not reading off any names, so they're anonymous. Um, so feel free to... Um, okay, we've got another one here. How can small businesses use schedules to identify potential teaming partners uh, if the small business wants to subcontract? Um, we... It would be a similar search and uh, they could get into the vendor level to see who is winning those contracts and see if, and I think Jim, you're gonna cover a little bit of that too, right? Yeah, so yeah, you're gonna look at your FPDS data and see who's winning the contracts. And, um, and if you're new to the federal business, 
really it's probably better to try and find a teaming partner to work with rather than going straight to the government. Yeah, and then um, the subcontract, uh, you know, if, if it's a large business and some of them, some of the awards will definitely have subcontract requirements. So companies could also search for that um, based on, you know, how that agency is procuring. So that's just another way. And I've got a couple things in my presentation as well on that piece. Yes. Okay. I think that covers it for our uh, questions. Uh, Archiza, any last thoughts about data, how to use it, or um, any information you want to share about uh, FedMine or GovSpend or um, how your <laughs> services work, your subscription services work? Yeah, so we are a subscription service. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, feel free to reach out to me, and I'll make sure that we uh, give you a good deep dive. Uh, in the both our platforms. Uh, right now, FedMine is a separate platform uh, than GovSpend, but uh, you know, hope, over time, um, our interface will change. But um, yeah, you know, we we love data, as you can see, and I've sort of tried to keep it. I was saying, Jim, I said, I'm trying to keep it super simple, but uh, we absolutely can delve more into details, get into transactional level details dissect the vendors, understand, uh, you know, from the vendor perspective, what is it that a company is winning, how much of it is going on GSA schedules, uh, what's expiring, who are the subcontractors that they might be working with too. Uh, you know, all of that data is made public and we integrate it. Um, so, uh, but everyone's case, use case is so different. So was really trying to be very generic here. <laughs> Okay, and one last question. I'll let you just uh, reiterate what we've um, mentioned, uh, I think, a couple times. Uh, question reads, GovSpend and FedMine are combining? Uh, FedMine is a GovSpend company, so I can answer your questions uh, more offline if you want to reach out to me. Uh, my email is in the presentation, uh, but otherwise it's amyhan at govspend.com. Great. And a uh, question about uh, where the PowerPoint slides will be. Uh, it's called slideshare.net. And I believe you can log into that site. It's free um, with your LinkedIn. Uh, the slides are not there yet. Uh, they will be posted there after today's presentation and the recording. Once it converts over to an MP4, it might take a couple uh, minutes. So usually uh, I'll say by five or six o'clock today, we'll have the webinar um, on our website, again, under the section called webinars, scroll down to the category on GSA schedules, and it will be listed there. Uh, also, again, slideshare.net, uh, and just give us a couple hours to get everything together. Sometimes we see some uh, edits that we need to make or a typo, so uh, thank you for bearing with us. And again, Archiza, thank you so much. Uh, data is so important. It's essential. Uh, there's no other industry that has this much data and the uh, FedMine GovSpend platform makes it easy to navigate, makes it easy to make your decisions um, and use data for your strategy. So thank you again for being with us today. Thank you for including me. <laughs> okay, always nice to have you. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next session. I think we're kind of on time here. Um, just a reminder that this coming Monday, can meet with nine uh, government entities, uh, eight of which are federal, um, and the plus one is the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. Um, we had sent out an email, I think, uh, yesterday, the day before, that had everyone's procurement forecast, so you can take a look and see what uh, all of the government entities are purchasing. On the uh, sponsor side, we've got Amazon, uh, BidSpeed, Bio One, Proposal Helper, First National Bank, Spartan Shield, Shaletta. We want to thank uh, Jim Bender, who's our third speaker today from ZK Development, as well as the Virginia PTAC for helping to promote the event. It's at the Kennedy Center again Monday, December 12th, which is this coming Monday, 5:30 to 7:30. Uh, we'll have about 200 plus federal government contractors um, there, as well as all of the organizations that I just mentioned. Okay, so we will move on the second piece here, uh, GSA schedule requirements and proposal preparation, uh, best practices. I see a question, I just wanna make sure that we haven't 
uh, to purchase tickets for the event, sorry, I forgot to mention that, uh, on our website, jennifershouse.com. If you navigate to the tab called events, you will find um, the event uh, link there. Okay, so now we are digging into requirements and proposal prep. Again, today's session is being recorded and you can find the slides on slideshare.net. Uh, this section is near and dear to my heart. Uh, well, they all kind of are. They all have their, their purpose uh, and they're all, I guess, equally important. But um, a couple things here about GSA schedules uh, that is only a mechanism for the government to purchase from you. And when I say only, I mean only. Um, it is one of many, many options. There are other contract vehicles out there. There are many different ways that the government can make purchases. Um, and as you saw in our Cheez's uh, slides, it's only used about 10% of the time in federal purchases. That still represents billions, with a B, billions of dollars. Uh, but you really need to understand how much the government is purchasing of your specific product, service, software, whatever it is, your your solution, your gadget, whatever it is you are selling. Uh, because that 10% might actually be 30%, um, or it might actually be 0.03%. Uh, and you should know what that actual number is. If you don't have that information, then you have no business getting onto the schedule. You should know that the federal government purchases 3.267 uh, and 32 cents worth of my product, service, or software through the schedule. And you can get that information again through uh, FedMind's platform. So contact Archiza, do your homework, and use that to determine if you should get a schedule. Uh, the schedule is really only a vendor shortlist. So if you think of um, going on to Amazon.com and you type in hair dryers and all of the companies show up that have hair dryers listed on Amazon. This is pretty much the same thing. Uh, the platform that the government uses is GSA Advantage, and they can type anything from bulletproof vests to Xerox paper. And the vendors that are on GSA will show up. Uh, and this is one of many ways that the government can purchase. Um, you've got about 18 to 20,000 companies that actually have a schedule. More than half have zero sales through their schedule. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that either somebody sold them something that they did not need or want, um, meaning a GSA consulting firm or consultant, um, or they, um, they thought that uh, they needed a schedule or they thought that they should get a schedule and then try to market it uh, without really understanding the terms, conditions, or potential repercussions. Uh, there's so much data uh, that's available that you don't need a subscription for. That's a little bit harder to navigate that way. Um, so we again encourage you to use the GovSpend uh, slash FedMind platform to make it easier to uh, quickly make decisions about schedules, about pricing, uh, contracts that are coming up for renewal and everything else that Archiza mentioned in the last session. So this is a, a visual that I put together that uh, is probably one of my favorite slides that I use often. And the numbers here on the left-hand side are really just averages. Um, and it's going to vary for your specific product, service, or software. So full and open competition, these are going to be the opportunities that you see on SAM.gov that anybody with an internet connection in uh, California, uh, Canada, or China can see uh, and can bid on. Um, again, those are SAM.gov, and that's where the majority of contracts uh, are going to be awarded. Then you've got department agency, um, department and agency vehicles. This is going to be um, uh, Navy Seaport E, NASA Soup, DHS Eagle, uh, State Department Evolve. So every federal department and some of the underlying agencies will have their own contract vehicles uh, because they don't want to pay the industrial funding fee to GSA in order to use the GSA schedule. So they came up with their own vehicles. So again, before you start uh, getting trigger happy and uh, moving forward with the GSA schedule, you want to make sure that that is the preferred mechanism of your buyer. So you should have had conversations with potential buyers again before you decide to get onto the schedule. Um, 
set asides, we'll say roughly 15%, these are going to be the small women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, A day, and, and all the other checkboxes. Um, simplified acquisitions, these are contract vehicles for, uh, or I'm sorry, contract vehicle for small businesses. Sole source, uh, that there's only one entity out there on the planet um, that can provide that type of product, service, or software. OTAs, these are non-FAR, Federal Acquisition Regulation, um, contracts that uh, are used only by specific uh, um, departments. I think it's DOE, uh, DOD, um, I would say DHS, and I think there is a part of DOT uh, that can also use OTAs uh, and others. So when you look at this pie chart, you should be able for your specific product, service, or software by using either FPDS, USA Spending, SAM.gov, or by going over again to the GovSpend FedMine platform, you should have numbers. Instead of those percentages, you should have actual numbers. So you know then, um, again, if you should be using your uh, money and time and effort to deploy maybe a sales and marketing rep to cover uh, full and open competition, or if the numbers look good enough for you to pursue the GSA schedule. Again, these are just averages. They're not uh, using anything like cyber or, or tile or any of the examples that our Chisa used. Um, so again, this is uh, the schedule is one of many, many options as you saw in the last so slide. Um, and here are some of the other um, department and agency contract vehicles that I mentioned on the last slide. NASA Soup, Navy Seaport E, the State Department of Olive Contract, DHS Eagle, uh, and the list go on and on and on. GSA just does a great job of marketing themselves, uh, and they can be used across all departments. So if you're going to pursue the schedule and you've done your homework, you should therefore then you should therefore have a pipeline of opportunities that uh, you've got people in there, names, faces that you've talked to that said, yes, we want to purchase your solution specifically from you and specifically through the schedule. Uh, if you decide to get a schedule and then start marketing it, that's really not a strategy. Uh, Jim Bender will be talking uh, more about this uh, in the next session. Um, another um, important thing that the successful contractors on the schedule do is um, they are able to take their uh, pipeline of opportunities and steal, steer these prospects into using the schedule. It just means that it's a smaller list of eyeballs that are going to see these opportunities. The only people that will see these opportunities are, in fact, the other schedule holders. Uh, you also want to make sure that you've completed your homework on pricing. The worst thing that can happen is you decide to get a schedule, you start filling out the paperwork, and then it comes down to um, the price negotiations with GSA. Uh, and I've got a slide on this, but uh, you want to make sure that your pricing is in sync with the other schedule holders. If your pricing is uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 percent or more higher than the schedule holders, uh, GSA will negotiate you down to the GSA averages. So don't go through the headache of putting all the paperwork together only to find out that GSA wants you to reduce your um, GSA rates by 20 percent. Um, and just to kind of synthesize uh, a lot of this, everything in sales is always going to come down to relationships. So if your relationships are with people within the government who prefer to purchase through the schedule, um, then certainly um, use that uh, use that as a tool to make your decision. Um, nourish these relationships, uh, steer them towards the schedule. Uh, the compliance matrix, uh, this is for just getting onto the schedule. Um, you want to make sure that you have something listed, whether it's an Excel spreadsheet or some other software that you use to ensure that you are meeting, um, that you're basically checking the box on everything that GSA uh, wants as far as the requirements. So that means reading the solicitation because the GSA schedule is really a, a full and open uh, RFP that anybody can read and respond to. Uh, you want to make sure that your SAM registration is complete, that you've got the right NAICS codes in there that match up to the special item numbers. Um, 
you want to make sure that your uh, DFARS and your FAR representation and certifications are accurate. Uh, your small business designation is current. If you've graduated from small business to large business, you want to make sure that that is accurately reflected in your SAM registration. Okay, now we're just going to talk about the actual proposal, the three main sections, administrative, technical, and pricing. I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. Um, you'll have your last two years balance sheet and income statement. They do not need to be audited. Uh, if you've kind of bled into 2023, then you can include your uh, year-to-date uh, 2023 financials. Um, any declarations, this is just the um, section in the GSAE offer that will ask you some information about your business and business dealings. Uh, again, your SAM information needs to be com complete and current. Um, two forms here that are kind of GSA, I'll call them test, uh, the readiness assessment and your pathway to success. I would encourage you to take those before you decide to get onto the schedule because they do ask a lot of good questions that will uh, require you to do homework uh, by using data to understand how many vendors are on the schedule within your category, um, how many have zero sales, and this can be very eye-opening. Uh, if you're using a outside consultant, you'll need the authorized negotiator form. Technical section, you've got um, about six or seven questions in each of the corporate narrative and the quality control uh, about executive experience, uh, number of years in business, and just your um, corporate backgrounds. The quality control uh, will be asking you about the processes and procedures that you have in place, how you deal with multiple contracts simultaneously, uh, how you deal with any um, errors that are encountered in your business you also need here in this technical section your uh, past performance information. Um, and this is a narrative with specific questions, about 10 questions overall. Uh, and so you'll need a contract that is relevant to what you are proposing to GSA, which makes sense. So if you're proposing construction management, you'll need a contract that is relevant to construction management. Uh, there are time requirements on the uh, past performance there. Uh, additionally, if you don't have the three CPARs, so if you're not a direct government contractor, you'll need to list five references. And there's specific data points for each of those five references. Uh, and there are also um, three questionnaires that uh, you will send to your clients, again, that are clients that um, have purchased services from you that, again, are relevant to what you're proposing to GSA. This is just a quick high level overview. I'm not going into all the details um, today. This is a service again that we do provide. Your pricing section is gonna list if you're providing professional services, your labor categories or your products, or if you've got software, you'll list uh, your software um, solutions there. You'll have to have an invoice for each and every line item that you're proposing. So if you're selling uh, glow in the dark disco bulbs, uh, you will need to have an invoice to show that you have sold this uh, product in the past. If you're selling uh, project management services, um, then you will need an invoice that shows that you have sold this service in the past. The invoices do not need to be from the government. Uh, they can be from a prime contractor. They can be from a church. They can be from McDonald's. It doesn't matter. An invoice is an invoice is an invoice. The price proposal template is a GSA template that you'll need to use. Uh, it's got about maybe 10 to 15, probably more like 15 columns that you will populate uh, listing all of the items, services, or software that you're proposing to GSA, along with commercial pricing, your most favored uh, customer pricing, uh, your proposed rates to GSA, and more. Uh, you also have your internal and your outward facing uh, GSA price list. If you're selling professional services, you'll need your HR policy. And um, basically what they're looking for there is how you um, compensate your employees and your overtime policy. If you're selling products, I think there was a question uh, from the last session about Canadian products. If those products are in fact uh, made in Canada or primarily made in Canada, uh, as long as Canada is on the TAA list, Trade Agreement Act, uh, which they are, um, that is fine. But please keep an eye on the uh, countries that are either on that list or not on that list. Sometimes, um, depending upon the um, executive level of government, who whatever the administration is, sometimes 
um, countries can either be removed or added to that list. So that is fluid. Okay, and uh, and then the next is you've got everything put together as far as your proposal. You then obviously want to go back and review it for quality. Um, sometimes it helps to have somebody that hasn't been involved in the um, quality control to look at it with fresh eyes. Um, you'll log on to the GSA e-offer site. Um, if you are submitting your offer uh, yourself or through a consultant, it's always good to have screenshots simply because um, you just want to have a record of everything that you have submitted. Um, keep the record number and the e-receipt. And then usually within about one to two weeks, you'll get a welcome letter that's just very generic. It'll list a person. Joe Smith is going to be reviewing your offer in the coming um, weeks, months. Um, sometimes it's more like months. Uh, and then what happens next is um, once they have reviewed your offer, you will get a, um, a list of questions, what uh, GSA will call clarifications. Uh, about your offer, and you basically you need to respond promptly to those. Um, once you respond to their questions, they move to what's called the price negotiations, and then you finally get to the uh, award. Okay, uh, again, the schedule is not for everyone. You want to make sure that you meet both the pre- and post-award requirements, but just because you're, you're tall enough to ride the roller coaster doesn't mean that you need to get onto the ride. Um, so keep that in mind because many companies do meet all of the requirements. They've got plenty of cash flow to cover the um, post-award compliance or to, to cover some basic um, uh, searches before or to cover kind of the marketing of the schedule. But um, maybe the government's only buying, you know, 0.3% of your solution through the schedule and they're using... Uh, another contract vehicle, they're using Navy Seaport E or um, one of the other contract vehicles that we mentioned today. So again, use the data. It is out there to make uh, smart decisions. Uh, don't, be, uh, don't be reactive to just um, seeing the GSA logo everywhere uh, or by somebody telling you that you need a schedule. You do not. It's an option only. Um, and you're going to need to meet certain terms and conditions within the schedule. Um, and if you don't, then they're going to basically boot you off the schedule. So you don't want to invest the time, the effort um, and money if you're using an outside consultant um, only to find that um, you've kind of boxed yourself in on pricing. Your customers don't even like using GSA. Uh, they prefer another contract vehicle or, or there's some other uh, mechanism that can be used. So some things that you should uh, be able to answer by using data, whether it's uh, GovSpend or FBDS or SAM.gov or USA Spending or any of the other um, data sets, data bases that are out there. Um, you should know how much revenue for your particular special item number is going through the schedule for the last four years. Typically, I would say the last three years, but because of the pandemic, there were some uh, peaks and valleys. Um, during that year. So you want to make sure that, you know, if you're selling event planning services, there were probably some, um, some valleys during, um, during the pandemic. If you were selling uh, sanitation and cleaning and medical supplies, you probably saw a, a nice uptick during um, the pandemic. So no, have that number um, and use that number to say, okay, you know, if the government is buying more than I don't know, uh, $5 million worth of our services and there's less than 200 vendors uh, listed within our special item number on the schedule, then yes, we will make a, a, a go decision. Like have parameters, have metrics, again, use data to make those decisions. You want to know who are the top companies that are winning most of the work within your special item number um, before you decide to get the schedule? You know, are they small businesses? Are they large businesses? Uh, what agencies or departments are they working with? And then again, compare your labor or your widget or your software uh, rates with the GSA averages. Um, Post-award, you want to remember that your pricing on the GSA schedule is only a price ceiling or a not to exceed rate. So if your widget is $100 uh, on GSA, that's the rate that you've uh, negotiated with GSA, um, 
typically through the schedule, you will be um, bidding and probably coming in at, let's say, $98 or $95 or however far you can go. Um, can basically stand the, uh, the margin dip there. Um, so keep that in mind that your GSA rates are a not to exceed rate. Um, and again, use the data to make business decisions. This is a business decision. It's not a, um, it should not be an emotional decision again, because you saw uh, the GSA logo on um, somebody's business card that's a competitor, but you know, maybe they've got zero dollars through their schedule. Um, you want to do an exhaustive search of all of your competition on the schedule. Um, and let me just move here. Okay, so I've got some screenshots here that I think should be um, helpful or hopefully are helpful to you, uh, as well as the links. And again, these slides will be on slideshare.net um, and the webinar will be on our YouTube channel, which you can uh, navigate to by going to our website, jennifershouse.com, go to the webinars tab, scroll down to GSA. Um, if you're selling products, you can look at GSA Advantage uh, to look at the other companies that sell similar products and look at their pricing. If you're selling services, GSA has a great pricing tool. It used to be the Calc tool, um, which is now uh, located through um, buy.gsa.gov forward slash pricing. And if you just want to look at your competitors and partners, um, I would suggest you go to the eLibrary site. And here's some... Um, this is a screenshot from the what used to be the Calc site. So what I typed in here was program manager uh, with five years of experience, bachelor's degree. So you've got parameters on the left-hand side that you can um, check off. Again, program manager, five years of experience, bachelor's degree. This is the GSA average, 162 per hour. So if your program manager is typically billing at, let's say, $200 or more with those same parameters, bachelor's, five years, um, you, you're basically going to be negotiated by GSA down to a rate of 162. Then as you start bidding through your schedule, you're going to come in lower than 162. Schedule may not be the best uh, tool for you. Uh, you may need to rethink your pricing. Uh, this is very important, again, before getting onto the schedule. Uh, if you're selling products, let's say you're selling metal detectors, this is from the GSA Advantage site. You type in products, metal detector, uh, and um, obviously you can, you'd want to compare some of the, um, the actual item description, uh, but this particular metal detector uh, comes in at a rate of almost $11,000. Uh, if yours are typically $16,000, uh, you might be negotiated down to this um, lower rate. If you're looking for, uh, let's say you are in the GSA category of 541611, and now I'm just on the left-hand side of the screen under the, um, where it says uh, category 541611, and you're providing management and financial consulting services. Um, there are 2,000, just below that, 2,631 contractors. Um, the pink arrow then is going to display uh, the contractor socioeconomic status. So S is going to be small, W is women, uh, woman-owned, uh, EW economically disadvantaged, woman-owned, uh, D disadvantaged, um, SDBO, service disabled, veteran-owned. If you see the letter O, O means other, other means large business. If you're a small business looking for large businesses to partner with, um, I would highly encourage you to look for these companies using that mechanism, register on their website and, um, and move from there. Uh, but you also then, uh, I would encourage you to take it a step further. The column to the right of the pink arrow will give you the company's price list. So again, if your project manager is $200 and the Lockheed Martin program manager is $100. If you're going to be a sub to them, they need to make money. So they're probably going to dictate a rate to you of $85 to $90 per hour. If you can't live with that, then don't go through the headache of jumping onto their website, registering as a small business vendor, creating a dedicated capability statement for them, and so forth. Um, so again, use this data. This is, again, a free website e, through the elibrary.gsa.gov 
to get this data. Use the data to make your decisions. Uh, on our website, we've got over 40 complimentary webinars on GSA schedules, uh, everything from pricing to subcontracting through the schedule, mentor protege, uh, joint venture agreements uh, through the schedule. Uh, again, they're all on our website, and this is where today's recording will be posted. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to hop over here and look at the questions. Again, please submit any questions that you have. If they're for another session or they're from um, the last session, we can uh, contact uh, Archiza to help us. And let me see here. Bear with me one second. I'm just going, uh, we're going to read these off in the order that they came in. And bear with me, see where we left off. Okay. Okay. How do we identify what product or service code we fall under, especially with emerging technology, things the government might not know they need? Um, so on the eLibrary site, you'll have a list of all of the special item numbers, the SIN numbers that uh, GSA uses, uh, and just simply by reading the descriptions, um, you can uh, determine what category you fall under, um, and then you would then, had you done your homework and decided that the schedule was right for you, you could then use that to continue your due diligence to look at the other vendors, look at their pricing, look at their services, their products, their software, their technology to make sure that uh, your products and or services are, excuse me, in sync with uh, that special item number. Okay, the next is... So, can, would... uh, Jennifer, can I say a thing about emerging technologies? Here's a good oh. example of something that's probably not bought through the GSA schedule. So, uh, cutting-edge emerging technologies are going to maybe bought in a different way. There's other transaction authorities that are really designed for developing technology. And uh, you ask a really good question because it can be challenging based on the procurement history to find out who's buying something new. Sometimes it's better to research the congressional authorization documents. Like I'm working with somebody who does AI stuff and blockchain, and there may not be a lot of history of the government buying that kind of stuff yet. So you look for how Congress is directing the agencies that they need to start using these new things and then follow the money to people who have control over it. Great, thank you. Uh, how would you describe the simplified acquisition purchasing? Simplified acquisition SAT, uh, simplified acquisition threshold, those are contracts set aside for small businesses. You can find we've got a uh, probably 20 uh, webinars on simplified acquisition. Uh, on our website. Uh, go to webinars, scroll down to Simplified Acquisition, and you can find more information there, and that's separate from GSA schedules. Um, we do, in fact, help companies getting onto the schedule. That was one of the questions. What is SIN, S-I-N, Special Item Number Project Experience? First, you identify the special item number that you're pursuing on the schedule. Again, that's relevant to the product services or software that you provide. Um, and what was I going to say? Uh, and then your project experience. These are the contracts that are relevant to that that you've done, completed, or performed in the past. Okay. Is an invoice the only support that is accepted by GSA? Does GSA accept a list from my contract with my customers showing labor category and the rates? Uh, the first. Um, the easiest way that, that you're going to get onto the schedule without really any pushback is, in fact, an invoice. Um, if you don't have an invoice, you can use a copy of a contract that does, in fact, have your labor rates. Um, to me, that indicates that the company is premature and has not um, really kind of uh, gotten to a point where uh, they've got a decent amount of revenue coming in. Um, so if you're using a proposal, it is acceptable. Um, it's, and it's, it's fine. It will fly. Um, it's not our preferred, um, uh, let's say documentation. Uh, again, it shows a company that's maybe a little bit, um, 
young, uh, which is not GSA schedule is typically not um, a good move for that. Um, but that's that's my opinion. Somebody else might uh, might agree. Um, can I use any labor category from any contract that I have, or does it have to be from the same contract that I'm showing past performance? Can uh, or can it be from any contract that I'm showing past performance for in the technical project write-ups? Uh, as far as the requirements for documentation for your uh, labor categories, you can use any contract. It doesn't have to be from your past performance uh, write-ups. Uh, do you do the market research for your clients? Um, okay. Special item number is SIN number. Does a subcontractor have to be part of a particular GSA schedule in order to team with a prime who is on a specific schedule that the opportunity is being competed through? No. So on um, that slide where I had the um, the GSA um, screenshot uh, where it has the column of small of the socioeconomic uh, categories, the small, disadvantaged, uh, O for other, other means large. You can use that. You do not have to be on the schedule to work with uh, companies that are on the schedule. Okay, if you have a schedule, what is required to, I'm assuming, add a new labor category? Uh, do you need to submit proof you sold or have invoices uh, for the new labor category proposed? Yes. So if you're adding any new um, LCATs, labor categories, or you're adding a new product, you're adding a new software um, option, uh, you'll need an invoice to, to show that you have sold this. If you're adding a new SIN, special item number, you're going to need a project experience just like you would uh, in getting onto the schedule. If you have a schedule, what is required to add a new labor category? Uh, just answered that with um, simply having an invoice to show that you have sold that labor category in the past. Do you need to submit proof you sold or have invoices for the new labor category? Yes. All, everything you're going to need to show that you've got the past performance as well as that you've sold this. We provide NAICS 54 and 56 series services to Department of Defense. We noticed that some DOD agents are using the GSA schedule more than others. What trends have you seen in the last three years of DOD purchases of, hang on a second, it's hard to read these. Uh, what trends have you seen in the last three years on DOD purchases of services through GSA schedules? We are agno industry agnostic and agency and department agnostic. So uh, I'd encourage you to conduct your uh, research and your homework on uh, FPDS, USA Spending, SAM.gov, GovSpend, FedMind to, um, to look at those trends. Is there a list of other agencies for new technologies to look for? Not sure I understand the question. Regarding the 60% of vendors never using their um, GSA schedule, is this number based on businesses written exclusively with the federal government or does it account for state, municipal, or other entities who may use the schedule? The 60% of vendors who have zero sales through their schedule, they could be selling to federal, state, local. It just means they have zero sales coming through their schedule um, for any federal, state, local. Uh, and there are um, some state, local uh, government entities do have the ability to use the schedule, as uh, does the UN, the World Bank, IMF, IFC, those things. Um, and you can get the full list on the GSA website. If you think your existing GSA schedule a mess and irrelevant to how how your business has evolved, where do you start in resetting it? I'm not sure I understand the wording, but uh, if you um, need to, you can always cancel and close out your schedule and pursue a, a new one. If you've got new products, new software, new, um, a new business model, new pricing uh, structure, 
Uh, you can also make modifications. I'd suggest you simply talk to your contracting officer, uh, perhaps talk to a legal person, uh, depending upon if you're, you define your mess as more pricing related or, um, or just a new business model, or maybe you've merged with another company. I'm not sure of the details, but um, I would say, um, yeah, definitely hire some, uh, some legal help to, um, to get a review and, and figure out the best strategy for um, either making a mod or getting a new schedule. Uh, can a systems integrator submit a kit with multiple products integrated into the proposed solution? For example, a fully integrated video cart system that includes displays, codec, and controller software. Uh, I'm not sure I understand submit a kit, and I'm not sure if you're talking about a GSA proposal or making a mod to add uh, a product. Um, I don't see why. Um, we worked with clients in the past who have um, created a product from a variety of manufacturers by assembling various components together. Um, so. Uh, okay, and I think that rounds it up for the questions. I'm going to move along here to our next slide, which is, again, just uh, reminding everybody that on Monday, December 12th, we've got an event at the Kennedy Center, eight federal uh, agencies or departments, plus the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority. Uh, Amazon will be there as a sponsor. Uh, you can sign up for this on our website, jenniferschaus.com. Go to the event section, and the event will be listed there. Yeah. Um, and Jim, you're up. I'm going to put myself on mute. Jim Bender is going to be covering, uh, uh, I can't speak anymore, marketing uh, your GSA schedule. Uh, Jim, the floor is all yours. Really appreciate your time today. And uh, thanks again. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Jennifer, for inviting me onto this panel. I'm passionate about GSA schedule. I have a lot of clients that I work with who use the schedule. It can be a great tool for winning more business in the federal government. So I'm the principal at ZK Development Solutions. We are a uh, company that works with small business, small and medium-sized contractors to expand their presence in the federal space. We work with startups. We work with people launching a new business line or want to grow their current business line. We've been around since 2013. We accomplish our goals through market research, capture and BD services, uh, sales and marketing, and proposal management. Pretty much everything I'm talking about today, I've covered on my blog, which is on zk-development.com, the tail end of my email address. Uh, so if you want more detail, go there, or just email me. I'm happy to answer questions. Next slide, please. So before we get started, we're going to make sure that we have a strategy. Marketing is an, uh, increasing your business through GSA is all about having a goal in mind, having uh, data to support your decisions on how to get there and have a path to go there. Uh, next slide. Uh, sometimes uh, people uh, I work with a lot of people who have an ill-defined strategy and how they're going to go to market and how they're going to use their schedule. Some things that don't count as a strategy is waiting for the RFP or RFQ to drop on SAM or on eBuy and then responding to it. Certainly, you can win a lot of businesses this way, but it's not the best way to do it. You want to be aware of these things before they drop so you can do your homework. We're going to talk about that homework in this presentation. Um, another strategy, which is a low percentage strategy, is responding to requests for proposals for quotes when the buyer has no idea who you are. Think about, uh, I'm having some work done on my yard right now, and I'm spending five digits in my yard there's no way I'm going to spend that kind of money on somebody who just sent me an email or I went to their website. I'm going to want references. I'm going to know who they are. I'm going to want to know what they've done before, before I buy from them. And federal buyers are way more conservative than you are. They, uh, the federal procurement system works in a way that really punishes mistakes and has a hard time for rewarding successes. 
Uh, so people are very careful about buying things and they don't buy from strangers. Bulk emails don't work well, try to avoid them. And selling your set aside doesn't work well. People don't succeed in the federal government by meeting their small business goals. There are some people who need to are responsible for small business goals, but the people who control the budget, the people who decide who gets the business, uh, they have uh, objectives that they have to meet in their agency uh, about getting a job done. And by the way, if they can meet their small business goals at the same time, that's great. But you better be able to do the work excellently. Next slide, please. So what does a strategy look like? Uh, we've talked, um, Archisa uh, touched on this in, in a very good way. Um, you wanna make sure you're focusing your efforts. The federal government is the largest buying entity in the world. There is no way you can market to all of it. Uh, the biggest contractor you know, think Northrop Grumman, they can't target everybody and you a small business or medium-sized business can't target everybody you've got to have a you've got to have some data that shows you where your best targets are um and uh that is who's buying your stuff who's able to buy it from you like are they using a buying mechanism that you don't have access to then they can't buy from you even if they want to uh, uh so they they need to buy your stuff and to be able to buy from you and ideally you're going to have past performance that is in the agency or looks like it and what i mean by looks like it is i have one of my clients who's brand new to the federal government space but she had done a lot of work for her state transportation authority and she was able to leverage that to get work in the department of transportation because transportation is transportation um your strategy is always going to be about people. People buy things. People in the government, people are people. And uh, they uh, buy from other people. So you want to come up with a way that you're going to find friends who are going to help you in your quest. So uh, when you're thinking about who to target, think about who you might know who can get you known there who can introduce you. Um, think about how you're gonna use vehicles to get there, um, the vehicles that you can access through partners, and if you don't have partners that uh, are on the vehicles that you need, how are you gonna find those partners? And lastly, um, think about what set-asides you have and what you can get. So you may be a woman-owned small business, or from a disadvantaged group like uh, black owned or Asian owned business? And is it worth it to get the 8A to uh, get that additional set aside? Next slide, please. So when talking about teaming partners, we're talking about an exchange. Uh, we're talking about uh, you have something for the teaming partner that they need and they have something that you need. Uh, teaming partners are critical to succeed in the federal space. Even the biggest of the big contracts have tons of teaming partners because you cannot possibly have everything you need to access every customer and meet all of their needs. Um, uh, if if you are not working with teaming partners, then you're greatly limiting your ability to grow your business as big as it could grow. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, teaming is about an exchange, about you offering something to them that they don't have and vice versa. And your challenge in coming up with a teaming strategy is to figure out where what you've got and what you need are going to match with a with a relationship. Um, so, inevitably, when people are looking at uh, how their services or the services that they offer, uh, who they're, who's the one that's successful in selling them, they come across some of the big dogs in the federal space, the Booz Allens, the Northrop Grumman's, and the SAICs, you know, you can think of the list. Um, and they immediately said, boy, if I should just get a meeting at SAIC, I'd be 
in. The problem is everybody sees that. Everybody's looking at the same numbers and they're all trying to get to them. And you know, they don't really have a corner on the market. They may have the largest slice, but you still need to sell to them. And sometimes they can be harder to get the attention of than the federal buyer itself. Um, please, I encourage you as you're thinking about teaming partners to look at the full spectrum of very large, sore large, medium-sized businesses, small businesses that are on the large side. Um, the small businesses are much easy, easier to get to pick up the phone and talk to you. And there are people in there, sometimes the CEO, who are talking to people all day and devising ways to come up with new teaming relationships. So please don't focus on the biggest of the big. Um, if you have a way to get in there, then great. Uh, but, um, but think more broadly than an FAIC. Another problem with trying to get into a Northrop Grumman or a Booz Allen, and I used to work at Booz Allen, so I know, there's like 20,000 people working there. So you have a friend that works at Booz Allen. Well, that doesn't, that friend does not know the other 19,000 people working there. And uh, even with leadership, I've, I've had this experience where I have a good relationship with leadership and he can't find the person who's working on the contract you're interested in because they're just so enormous. So there's a lot of challenges with the big companies. The small companies, there's a couple of people that know everything that's going on and they can be just as good a teaming partner if they have the uh, right background. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so here are some of the things I said that uh, teaming is about a relation relationships and exchanges. Here are some of the things that you're gonna barter with potential teaming partners. Vehicle access, very little, uh, well, a lot, I, I shouldn't say very little because Jennifer is gonna tell me something else. But um, a lot of things are getting bought on vehicles today. And, and there's a good chance that what you're trying to sell uh, get, often gets bought through a vehicle. There are certain trends in federal government procurement. There's this thing called category management and best in class vehicles, where there's incentives to push things onto these big vehicles. And if you're a new business to the space, you are not gonna be able to get on these right away and you're gonna need friends to help you with the vehicles. Um, agency pass performance is critical. I don't know how many federal customers I've talked to and I say, well, you know, I've done your service for the Coast Guard and uh, certainly the Army, if they're buying the same service, uh, that, that counts. And they say, yeah, you know, the Coast Guard is really completely different because, and I'm just using them as an example, but every federal agency thinks they're unique. Um, and no matter what the evaluation criteria say, they're gonna count uh, experience, relevant experience within their agency differently than outside of their agency. Now, I'm gonna skip down a, a, a bullet to client intimacy because agency past performance is not the same as client intimacy. Agency past performance says you're familiar with the agency, you've worked with them, you know something about their mission. Client intimacy says you know something about the people in the office that's doing the buying. You have relationships. And if you are calling um, a contractor that is interested in a certain procurement and you have another job inside of that office and they don't, they're going to take that call. Client intimacy is very valuable because it tells that you know more about what's going on in there, who are the decision makers, what's important to them, what the new director has been pushing, even if it's not written in the RFP. So um, when you and, and when you call up one of these big contractors and you want to talk to them about a certain requirement they're gonna that's the first thing they're gonna ask you about do you know anybody in the office because that's always critical that inside information expertise being actually being able to do the work as it's described in the scope of work is of course important and um uh, a lot of times a teaming relationship can be built on the fact that uh, the the, the lead partner has 80% of the scope 
uh, covered internally with their own past performance and they need help with the other 20% and you can provide that. Uh, another uh, possibility is capacity or just being able to find the people with the specific qualifications and certifications and backgrounds that the agency is needing. Uh, so it can be the capacity to just deliver the number of FTEs that are on the contract, or it can be the capacity to deliver the specific qualifications for people and the expertise that they're looking for, especially if it's uh, it, you know something with a scientific bent or a very technical bent. And then uh, there's some um, uh, the certifications for your company or for your people like facility clearance certifications like uh, CMMI, ISO 9000, PMP. Um, the more of these that you have that are relevant to your sales, uh, the, the, the more conversations you're going to have. Um, and then I, I put here last on the list because I want you to remember you should think of it as last on the list is your set aside. Yes, you're small. Yes, you're veteran owned. Maybe even you have an A day. But unless you have these other things that are really valuable in awarding the contract, um, it's, it's not going to uh, go as far as you think. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please. So people, it's all about people and talking to people. So your marketing is going to be about finding people who can help you and arranging meeting with, with them. Um, it's networking, it's sales. Uh, so how are you gonna find these people? I'm gonna tell you that LinkedIn is your best friend. Your best friend in the whole world is LinkedIn because every company has a uh, company page and you click on there and they're all your employees and they have titles and you can search on the titles. And if you're looking for somebody to talk about teaming, you search for business development, chief growth officer, maybe CEO. Um, and, and even better, you click on their link. And you can see what college they went to, where they've worked before, and if there's overlap, something for you to put into the intro email or phone call to make a relationship. Um, there are plenty of other places to find people. There's um, on the funding side, on the agency side, they all have org charts because they're required um, in their congressional authorization documents. Uh, the org charts will help you understand how the agency is organized. Sometimes the names on the org chart are outdated, but then you can cross-reference the org chart. So if you find the Office of Women's and Health, in Health and Human Services, you can go to their employee locator and you can look at all the people that work in the Office of Women's Health and you can search on, if it's a big office, you can search on titles and, and try to find people who are relevant. Back to teaming partners, uh, every, every company has a website and they have an About tab. <laughs> Under the About tab is the leadership team and you can usually find somebody there who has a title that you want, either a technical person or a BD person. I will say in my experience, when you're approaching a new company, uh, it's usually easier to get a hold of the person who's responsible for business development and capture because part of their job is to meet people all the time. Whereas the technical leads, you know, they're working on getting their work done and they want the BD person to spend their time talking to people like you. But that's okay, because once you impress the BD person, they're going to introduce you to the right technical person to close the deal. You wanna look at industry day participant lists. Uh, you uh, want to go to industry days and network. Um, they're, they're, they're coming back to be in-person things, and that's a great way to not only hear from the people at the federal uh, agency uh, or the large contractor because large contractors have uh, um, partnership days. Uh, but they're also a way to meet other people in your industry who are interested in the same requirement and may be interested in teaming with you. Um, 
for small businesses, you can look at SAM.gov entry, um, and they will usually have the CEO and a BD contract. Um, for larger businesses, you're going to look for the supplier diversity of the small business office, and they're always going to make you fill out a form before they'll talk to you. And um, it can feel like uh, it's a waste of time to fill out that form, but uh, they won't talk to you until you fill out the form and directed all their employees and talk to anybody from outside until they filled out the form. So you're going to have to fill out the form when it gets into their database. And um, <clears throat> then you also want to take advantage of um, the matchmaking and the meetings that uh, Ostaboos hold. Uh, uh, there are a lot of agencies who, who have uh, Ostaboo meetings. This is the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. Ostaboos, every agency has one. They may be called different things, but they're they're there to help small businesses win business in their agency. Um, and they will have meetings where they'll talk about upcoming procurements. Um, I was in an Oscaboo meeting where they told me about a big uh, requirement that was coming up that my one of my clients couldn't perform on, but she said they have a 30% small business requirement on it, and the RFP is coming out in January. So I got my client working on finding people to team with on that. So there's a lot of ways to find people. Um, and finding people is going to be the most important. Uh, finding people and talking to people about your business is going to be the most important thing you do. Next slide, please. So how do you approach uh, teaming partners for your GSA contract? Um, you're going to find the right person to approach, and a little later on, there's three different types of people. I'm going to talk to you about the different questions that you ask the different kinds of people. You look for people at teaming partners, that business development, capture, growth in their title. Um, who is going to make the introduction? Um, that's a really interesting question. and and. Uh, I, I recently had one of my clients tell me that it's actually better for the introduction to come from a BD person because she says when she's contacted about teaming relationships from CEOs of companies, she says, why does the CEO have so much time that they can send out all these emails, and make these phone calls? I don't have that much time. I'm too busy running the company. So that's an interesting thought that a BD person makes the uh, first contact and then they then they set up the meeting with the CEO even for a real small company. Um, a lot of times peer-to-peer -peer is best. That's another way of thinking about it. If you're a BD person, find the BD person. If it's a technical person, uh, a senior technical person, it might be a technical person from your company that reaches out. Um, there are many ways to do this. Um, what is really important is to be specific about what you're asking. Uh, so you don't want to reach out to a company and tell them, like, gee, I really want to work with you. I love your company and um, I need this I need subcontract. You, you want to tell them what, what you got. You want to know what they could possibly need. And you want to tell them uh, that, hey, I can offer that to you. Here's what I've got. And if there's a specific procurement that's coming up, and that's going to get a, a conversation more often. It's there's a specific procurement, like a big contract they're recompeting on, and you have an idea of what they might need on the recompete, um, then that's more likely to get an answer and get, get interest. So tell them what you've got. Be specific about what you have to offer. Be specific about what you're interested in talking to them about, not just general capabilities briefing. And um, and and that will be specific about what you want them to do. And I'm just going to say bulk email is very problematic. Um, uh, Untailored uh, emails to busy people uh, end up getting you spammed. Um, bulk email might work in putting out information about what you do in such a way that is providing freebies. Uh, but not putting out marketing information because that's just going to get you deleted and moved on and 
people will remember your business because you filled up their inbox with useless stuff. Next slide, please. So here's a sample introduction email. Uh, I like to pride myself on being able to do the uh, cold email that can get, get a response. So the first paragraph is a very brief description of what the company is and what they offer. Uh, you have a couple of points that are what you think the person should be interested in you for. So this is a, 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 a business services training company, PMP, what's their big thing? They have a big training catalog, leadership challenge, Lean Six Sigma. These are the things that the federal government buys from them. They have past performance in DOD and they've worked internationally. Um, and then a differentiator. So the differentiator with this company I was working with was, it wasn't, they weren't just about what happened in the training room, but they, they stay with their trainees over months after the, after the training to make sure that they apply what they learn and in this case pass the PMP. And then um, finally you close it out with um, the ask, you know, what's the action item? What do you want them to do? Um, 20 minute meeting, don't ask for 30, 30 is too long, 20 minutes sounds doable. You might go with 15 and, um, and you might also mention a specific opportunity that you're looking at or a set of opportunities like I know you work a lot in NAVC and we've done a lot of training in um, an adjacent agency and we thought maybe some of your clients might have value in this. So what I am gonna say is think of this email, think of the Outlook page. Uh, if you have Outlook, think of the preview page when you click on an email if what you have to say doesn't fit in that preview pane, it's too long. Make it short, make it tight, make it compelling as possible so it's easy for them to say, oh, uh, yeah, maybe I'll meet with this person or I'll give it to um, my uh, capture person and have her follow up with it. Uh, so, and, uh, I'd like three points, three reasons to talk to me. No more than five, don't get long. You better know exactly what this person needs and what they're gonna be interested in. And if you don't, go back and do more research to find out what they're possibly gonna need. But don't give them your whole training catalog. Don't give them uh, every NAICS code you uh, claim to work under. Keep it tight, keep it memorable. Next slide, please. So in uh, your work with federal agencies, there's going to be uh, two kind. There's going to be three kinds of uh, people that are involved in the procurement decision. There's going to be the contracting staff, and these are the people that are easiest to find on a particular requirement because they have to sign the contract, and that's usually recorded in FBDS, and you can find their email and their phone number. Consequently, they're overwhelmed with phone calls and you better have a very good reason for them to talk to you. And all they're gonna really wanna talk to you about is the specifics of what vehicle they're on, when's it coming out, where they are in the process. And they may not even tell you that because they may think they're giving you an unfair advantage. But uh, if you see an upcoming requirement that you think you can really do, and especially if it's uh, possibly a sole source situation, like an SD, it's an SDV OSB being recompeted, that was sole source or an 8A, uh, then your email could be welcome. Um, uh, the, the second person who's involved, so the contracting staff, they're ones who legally obligate the, the government to spend the money, but just the program staff who decides which contractor to choose, who sets the requirements. Um, and in the pre-proposal pre phase, those are the ones that you really wanna to get to, if you can, to talk about your offering and help them with the requirements. So if you really are a bona fide expert in what you sell, um, oftentimes they're interested in talking to you and throwing around ideas about what they planned on an upcoming requirement, and you can give them feedback based on you know, what you know and what the trends in the industry are and how they can save money and get their job done better. 
And the FAR not only allows us, they encourage it because feds can't know everything about what's going on. Um, and then the third uh, kind of person that you're gonna to go to in your uh, GSA marketing is small business advocates. Um, they are there to help you, the small business, do better, but they are not your servants and they have way more to do than any human being could possibly do. Um, so you have to be really specific <clears throat> about what you ask them. Uh, I've contacted this contracting officer. I just wanted to know the status of this uh, requirement. Is it gonna be set aside? What vehicle's on? I can't get an answer. And usually what they'll say is, well, email them again and then copy me. And when um, you can say, the Ostabu of the agency told me to contact you and ask about this upcoming requirement. I've seen it happen. I, the, the CO that I've emailed three times suddenly has time to respond to my email because I actually did speak the Ostabu and they said to respond. So make sure you're contacting the right person about the right thing. Uh, you know, the, don't ask the program staff about what vehicle it's going to be on. They are not the ones that are making the decision. It's the contracting staff and don't ask the contracting staff about, you know, what are the evaluation criteria going to be because the program staff is working on that. Um, there are a lot of ways to find these people. Um, there are small business, uh, there are small business advocates with GSA. They can also help you with this and the link is provided. Next slide. Um, there's a lot of uh, networking groups other than the small business industry days at your agencies. There's a lot of trade, uh, the trade organizations. Yeah, some of them are named here. Um, there, it, there are specific uh, trade organizations for your particular offering that have uh, uh, a federal or government uh, working group or an interest area. Getting active in there and meeting people is a great way to meet people. Um, information is provided uh, through these groups. NCMA, boy, I have a lot of clients who just swear by their NCMA membership because they meet people and they find out things through meeting with people there all the time. Um, uh, it, and, and another networking method is back to LinkedIn. Uh, there are tens of thousands of feds on LinkedIn and they're looking there for information about uh, what they are buying and uh, you can be part of that conversation. If you get into the right discussion groups and you find them and find what groups they're in, um, you can get them in a conversation there. Next slide. Um, I, uh, I, I have this blog post um, that I wrote recently based on a conference I went to about seven quality questions for sales calls. Um, I don't have time to really go into it, but I, I'm just in love with the seven quality questions for sales calls. So I encourage you to go to my blog post and look at it. If you don't, you know, when you get in front of a buyer, you don't know how to do the call and what to say to them. Um, almost every buyer I've ever met does not want you to go through your capabilities briefing because it's boring. They want you to talk to them about their problems and, and talk to them about how you can solve them. Um, and so uh, take a look at this blog post, so, you know, you keep the spotlight on them, you ask open-ended questions, and you listen more than talk. Um, next slide, just a couple of things about uh, data. Um, data. I'm a data nerd too, I just love data. Um, make sure you're accessing the FBDS data which runs through USA Spending, FBDS, GovSpend, GovWin, GovCry. There's a bunch of ways that it can get sliced and diced. I'll, I'll say the proprietary ones where you have to pay a subscription or better, they're just set up so you can do your job better on these. Make sure you're utilizing it. Um, and also I have a couple of more slides after this about how you can access, uh, next slide, directly uh, the GSA Data to Decisions website. It's a little clunky, but you can do some nice reports through here to see um, where the sales are happening on your schedule. The next slide, this one is a, a report I ran. Uh, to go to the next slide, please. 
This is a report I ran for um, document scanning for a recent client. And you know this this is their NAICS code, and I just ran this, and it says, okay, here's here's got the most sales on your NAICS code, and some of these are not small businesses, so this was a small business. You might be able to help them with that. Uh, so for your homework on the next slide, I want you to make sure you use these methods to develop a call list. A call list, that is a list of people, uh, federal government agencies and teaming partners that you're going to call, and you're going to set aside time every week to make calls. You're going to go to two to four events a month and meet people, and you're going to persist through all the no's you're going to get, all the unanswered emails and unreturned calls until you get to the yes. Thank you, Jennifer, for allowing me this platform to talk about my stuff. Uh, I will answer questions and I will, and the questions that we don't get to, please email me. Great, Jim, excellent presentation. I'm gonna put my reading glasses on here and, uh, and dig into some of these questions that have come in. Um, and let me just go back to where we, left off um okay let's see here um how can we locate today's slides again slideshare.net uh i think our company profile in there is just uh, jay shouse and associates and you'll see uh, about um 600 well close to 600 uh presentations you can just do maybe a keyword search um and again the Today's uh, presentation is being recorded, so you can find the recording on uh, on our website under webinars and navigate to the section called GSA Schedules. Um, okay, we've got uh, some kudos out to you here. Excellent presentation with specific recommendations, uh, with a lot of experience. Thank you. And the next one says, what is MCMA membership? You want to, you're a member, and I think you're more active, Jennifer. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, sure. This is, uh, I think they're probably asking NCMA, National Contract Management Association, their um, contract management. Um, also got APMP, Association Proposal Management Professionals, I think, which um, has maybe rebranded or changed their name a little bit. Um, and let's make sure, and that is it. Any other uh, questions that we've got for Jim? We've got a question about our event, which again is on our website, not the GSA website, but uh, jennifershouse.com, go to events, and the holiday soiree will be there. Um, yeah, again, today's presentation is being um, recorded. It's on the... Uh, on our, it'll be on our website once this is over. Give us a couple hours to convert the recording, get it onto YouTube, uh, get the slides uh, edited if we have any edits um, to make. And they, again, will be on slideshare.net. Let's see if we've got uh, Karen Long. She looks like she is here and perhaps ready. Karen, can you give us an audio hello if you are there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll come to you in one moment. Jim, any last thoughts or um, concluding remarks on marketing your GSA schedule? And I actually, I do have a couple questions here for you. Uh, what is the right time to market my GSA schedule? Oh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Um, I mean, once you have the GSA schedule, you got to make sure it's prominent on your website. You're going to make sure wherever it is on where it is on your website, when you click on the logo, that it's going to go straight to your price list so that people don't have to search through the e-library to find your company and maybe spell your name wrong. You want to link right to the price list so they can go there and look, uh, look at how to buy from you. Um, you know, uh, in the first half of the federal fiscal year, so that's October 1 to, what is it, March 30, um, that's really sort of a marketing period, although it goes on forever, but that's the best time to get out 
and meet people and make relationships and make impressions. In the second half of the fiscal year, particularly in the fourth quarter, everybody's pedal to the metal, um, putting, uh, buying and selling. Uh, so getting uh, a meeting to talk about an upcoming requirement with a teaming partner or getting a buyer to talk to you about your company, uh, they just don't have time then because they're just uh, too busy. If they're the buyers, they're too busy writing, getting the proposal out the door. And then once it's out the door, uh, evaluating and awarding the contracts. And then for the sellers, they're too busy writing proposals. I mean, yeah. Great. And I would, I know that you said to put the GSA logo on your website. I would um, respectfully add to the back of your business card, to your capabilities statement, to your auto signature and your emails. Yeah. Uh, make it easy. The easier it is to find you, to find your price list, to find what you're selling, uh, the easier it is the easier it is going to be to work with you. Um, and people's emails, if, if you don't have a link to your website and you're just putting in your auto signature, your email address again, that's kind of redundant. We, we already know your email address. So a link to your website or a link and or a link to your um, GSA schedule catalog is uh, so important. Um, okay, number two is how do I get a list of who buys my services uh, on the GSA schedule? Ah, well, you can just uh, back up a couple of slides when you get this. It's slide 57 on my count. And you go, uh, the GSA, um, the GSA has uh, what's called a schedule sales query plus SSQ plus. It's easy enough to find. Um, where you could put in your NAICS code uh, or your SIN. Uh, and if you want to look back to the, the historic schedules like IT70 or 5418, uh, you can put those into and you can run a report by fiscal year of the contractors that were awarded contracts that way. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a free free website open to anybody, um, but it also has a disadvantage that's a little bit clunky and hard to figure out. Uh, so ideally what you're gonna wanna do is get a subscription to one of these uh, aggregators of federal data like um, uh, FedMine or um, the others, and, uh, and, and they'll be able to aggregate it much easier for you and get to it easier. I mean, that's, that's why you use them. Everything that, everything that providing through there for the most part is public information, but it's um, it's harder to work with, especially if you're new. Um, so it is, uh, for, in my opinion, it's really worth investing. You know, it can, it can be a couple of hundred dollars a year. It doesn't have to be a fortune. I mean, GovWin uh, has the majority of this market, but they charge very high prices. I, mean, I think that pricing, you know, just to be honest, the pricing is not worth what they sell. There's plenty of alternatives out there that do a great job of aggregating the public, publicly available data to help you find answers to questions, stuff like that. Great. And yeah, and I think uh, with that question, as far as uh, getting a list of who buys your services, that should have been done upfront before you decided to get the schedule. So you should uh, have that list uh, exhausted and updated on a regular basis. Uh, but yeah, plenty of cost-effective mechanisms out there. Uh, number three is, uh, what are the five most important parts of a GSA schedule marketing plan? Ooh. Five most important parts. Uh, the strategy of who you're targeting, what agencies, and what sub-agencies. So you're not targeting the Department of Defense because the Department of Defense is enormous. You may not even be targeting the Department of the Army, which is a sub-agency, which is also huge. You don't have the capacity to target them. You probably want to get down to the command level, um, uh, especially if you're looking to do uh, personal outreach. There are exceptions to this, but 
largely you want to choose the best places based on the data where you think you can succeed and focus uh, focus your attention there. You want to develop a list of people to call. Um, and you just want to be calling people all the time um, and, and figuring out how to meet people who are making buying decisions, who you can team with to uh, pull together all the capabilities you need to respond uh, to a proposal. You want to uh, use that call list. Uh, you want to have a pipeline, which means once you've got your target agencies figured out, you go into those agencies and you look at the expiring contracts uh, for what you sell and get uh, uh, 12 to 24 months in front of them or at least six months in front of them so you can do some preparation for them. And you also want to look at the pre-solicitation notices that are coming out and figure out how you're going to team up to respond to them. And then there's the other things like your capabilities brief, a nice federal landing page, a website that works because you know the first thing that they're going to do when they hear about your company is put you into the Google bar. And if you have a crummy website, uh, I mean, it's embarrassing when an IT provider has a website that doesn't have a security certificate. And my browser tells me it's risky to cruise this website. What does that say to your buyer? <laughs> I think uh, your website has got to look good. It's got to make you look good. It doesn't have to be whiz bang um, and the highest tech thing, but it's got to be professional and it's got to be easy to navigate and find the stuff you need. I'm sorry, Jennifer, I'm running over time. Okay, and I think that was uh, pretty much the last uh, question. So uh, thank you, Jim. Really appreciate your time and your presentation. And we're just going to move on to our next slide here. Uh, again, a reminder that uh, Monday we've got eight federal agencies, including several from DOD, Army Corps of Engineers, NAVAIR, NSWC, National Guard. Uh, also uh, in attendance will be State Department, Department of Ed, Education, Department of Interior, Health and Human Services. Uh, those are the eight. And then the ninth is the Metropolitan Washington Airport Authority. Uh, our sponsors are Amazon, First National Bank, Spartan Shield, Bio One. Proposal Helper and Bid Speed. You can buy a ticket on the Jennifer Schaus website, which is jenniferschaus.com. Navigate over to events and you'll see it listed there. Uh, if you're looking for today's presentation, give us a couple hours to put this together. It's on, again, our website, jenniferschaus.com. Navigate to webinars, scroll down to GSA um, schedules, and you'll find it there. The PowerPoints are all on slideshare.net. Okay, now we're going to move over to Karen Long, who's going to bring it home with uh, GSA schedule compliance and reporting. Karen, you can take as long or as short as you need. And uh, when you get to the end of your presentation, I'll read off the questions that have come in and feel free to um, tell us a little bit about streamlining yourself uh, today. And thanks for being patient with, uh, with us and your, your time today. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate you uh, having Streamline uh, participate. So again, really appreciate it and appreciate everybody who joined today. Um, and I will just start with telling you a little bit about Streamline Government Contracts. I'm Karen Wong, the president and founder of Streamline Government Contracts. We are an outsourced solution for contract management. So this includes things like negotiating teaming agreements, subcontracts, preparing estimates at completion, completion, setting up processes, and being the point of contact for the government or for your partners. Um, we practice what we preach, and we help companies reduce risks and increase profits. So again, um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for tuning in today. Um, if anyone has a uh, question, um, you're welcome to email me uh, as well as, you know, obviously uh, send your question into Jennifer, but also uh, we would be happy to have a 30 minute consultation if we can be of assistance. Um, so let's uh, go to the next slide, please. All right. So 
I chose these topics because these seem to be the most uh, problematic or I have the, I get, I've received the most questions about them, I'll say. Um, and we could talk with our, we could talk for hours and hours, but um, obviously time is a factor. So, you know, I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some key points, some key factors, um, some uh, common problems that I see, and also um, preventive techniques so that you don't run into these problems. Um, before we begin, I'm gonna be, I just wanna mention to you, I'm going to be talking about the standard terms and conditions with GSA. Um, what I mean by this is if you have TDR, which is transactional data reporting, there are going to be some exceptions to what I say. Um, but again, because time is an element and uh, um, TDR is the exception, I'm going to go with the standard terms and conditions for the presentation. Um, next slide, please. So most favored customer, let's talk about what the most favored customer is just to refresh everybody's memory. Um, so your most favorite com customer is what you submit when you submit your GSA proposal. This is what you're basing your prices on. And you're saying that you will give GSA either less than or equal to pricing to your most favored customer. This can be a specific company, commercial business, or federal government as a whole. So for example, uh, maybe you, uh, you're a subcontractor to CACI. Well, CACI could be your most favorite customer. You could also just have an exclusive commercial business having nothing to do with the federal government. That could be your um, commercial, uh, um, uh, that could be your most favorite customer could choose NIH or again, the government as a whole, et cetera. So again, um, the key thing is, is to know who your most favorite customer is and to set up your files accordingly because um, as, every, um, as you know, uh, you the GSA schedule lasts for a long time. You have your five-year base period and then you have your three, five-year option period. So you're gonna have turnover during that time and I will tell you, uh, we're going to talk about assessments later in this, but um, I am surprised by how many companies do not know who their most favorite customer is, um, according to GSA, and that's going to create some issues for you. So again, um, uh, we, we will talk about that. Some common problems that I see is, again, um, you know, tracking the most favorite customers. And my suggestion is, is to set up some sort of system. Um, I'm an Excel geek, so I like setting things up in Excel, but whatever works for you. But something that you can maintain and update over time um, to track. The other thing is, is to um, ensure that you do not exceed your GSA ceiling price. Um, this sometimes happens when companies have either a low escalation on their GSA schedule year to year within the, within the period of time, the base period, option year one, et cetera, um, or again, just not being aware. So for example, when you get new, um, when you go to bid on contract, you want to ensure that even when you get to, um, let's say option year four, you're not exceeding your GSA schedule price for that year. Um, uh, what sometimes helps is having a, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but having kind of like a quality check. So before you submit a proposal to ensure that it is not going to, um, to ensure that it's not going to exceed your GSA proposal price. Next slide, please. Okay. Should this happen, um, and should, uh, and should you have a, um, we're going to talk about the price reduction clause. And what you need to be aware of is if, in fact, you, back to your most favorite customer, you want to make sure that 
you are not giving your most favorite customer a more favorable price than GSA. Um, if in fact this happens, you want to notify GSA within 15 days, that's the condition. And GSA does have a lot of penalties throughout their clauses. So again, um, hopefully, you know, you want to take preventive action and ensure this doesn't happen, but you want to come clean to if it does. And then that will um, prompt you and force you to then change your GSA schedule pricing. So just um, just to uh, give you a heads up on that. So again, um, touched on this before, but what um, for an internal control sometimes, uh, what I have seen done, which is very effective, is to have uh, a GSA check group in the proposal department before the proposal goes out the door before really before the pricing gets finalized to ensure that you're not going to be giving another um, agency a more um, who's your most favorite customer a lower rate than gsa next slide so the industrial funding fee which is 0.75% is due to no later to the government after no later than 30 days after each quarter. So we're talking April 30th, July 30th, October 30th, and January 30th. So it's important to have some sort of contract calendar or something of that nature to track this and to make sure you're paying on time. And just a personal experience that Streamline had is we were assisting a client with due diligence. They were considering buying a company. Um, and in completing the due diligence, we had discovered that they hadn't paid their um, industrial funding fee for two years. So obviously, number one, um, you know, that brings up a uh, bright red flag. Number one, that they're probably not in, um, you know, the most uh, favored position with the government. And then also, it also made us think, okay, well, they aren't on top of their IFF. What else are they not on top of? So it just helped or made us scrutinize even a little bit harder. So, um, and, you know, 0.75% is, uh, you know, a relatively low fee. So, it was not a lot of money comparatively or relatively speaking, so it just seems silly that they were not on top of it. Um, so your IFF is due on all schedule items, not required on open market items. And so a question I get um, often is, do we pay an industrial funding fee on travel? And assuming that, um, unless it's included in the firm fixed price, like let's say you're doing a training and you're including the travel and the training as one price. Um, other than that, travel would be considered an open market item and would not be, you would not be required to pay for it on your, um, in your industrial funding phase. And I've actually, we've actually had clients who have um, overpaid their IFS because they have included travel and believe it or not, GSA doesn't, as much as they don't like you to underpay, they also don't like you to overpay. Uh, and understand and realize that GSA has a financial incentive to audit um, contractors' compliance with the industrial funding fee. So your industrial funding fee goes towards the, um, the advertising that GSA does, the contracting officers, the, you know, all the work that goes into GSA from the government perspective. So um, they have an incentive to try to find things that haven't been paid. That's, so just as an FYI. Um, and then um, some things that I see uh, or that I see often is that GSA contracts are not clearly in companies' accounting system. So GSA should be set up as, as the customer, even if the end customer is NIH. If it's on the GSA schedule, you want to set it up 
so that you can run reports and it's clearly you're not going to miss anything you're going to have all your all of your contracts that are based on the gsa schedule so i can't emphasize that enough um, the other things that are helpful is you know ensuring that the gsa contract number is on the invoice making sure that the sin number is on the invoice um, and to develop some systems along those lines so that those things do not get missed um, then another um, issue that i have seen is contractor teaming arrangements and i'm not talking about just teaming agreements or contracting streaming arrangements as described in the far but i'm talking about specifically to GSA and then many agencies have also copied GSA with this um, uh, with the with the idea but a contractor teaming arrangement that I'm talking about is when two companies decide they both um, they need to both use their schedules in order to meet the government's needs so what happens is two companies will prime together and the, both of the schedules are on the contract. And again, both of the companies are officially primed. And so um, if we're talking labor categories, it's pretty easy to track the IFF for that. But what gets a little more complicated is if the contract is a firm fixed price, then it's important to uh, ensure that you are it's getting calculated correctly and that the correct party is also paying the IFF. Um, for blanket purchase agreements, of course, it's not on the blanket purchase agreement itself, but it is on any orders that come under the blanket purchase agreement. So just something to be aware of. Next slide, please. Service contract labor standards, and um, I will say I often still call it SCA, even though that is a an old term, Service Contract Act. Um, I think many people in the who've been in the industry for a while um, still call it the SCA, but um, we're talking about the same thing here. And Service Contract Act uh, is applicable on GSA contracts. So with all the terms and conditions that you get with your GSA contract, and it is important to be aware of those, know that um, this is going to be applicable. The question that I got, I, we get often, and actually just got this week, in fact, um, is what happens if the wage determination is higher than our price on our GSA schedule? Um, or what happens if the executive order with the new minimum wage requirement is higher than what is on our GSA schedule? What do we do? Well, what you need to do is, again, back to what we said about the ceiling price. You can't go above your ceiling price um, on to, to invoice. But what you can do is apply for and submit a equitable adjustment proposal. Um, to be compensated for the difference. And um, equitable adjustments are a whole nother topic, but that's how you would handle it. Uh, again, you still have to pay your employees whatever the wage determination or minimum wage requirements say, but you also need to comply with your GSA schedule. Next slide, please. So contractor assessments. Um, uh, I know I'm a geek here, but um, I, I really, uh, I, I kind of have to say I enjoy these. I've been involved with these since like the early 2000s and they've changed over time. Once upon a time, um, they actually used to come in person and would come from all over the uh, country and people would fly into, for example, um, the DC metro area from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, or Boston, et cetera. Um, now, of course, they are virtual. Nonetheless, they are still really important. The other thing that I've noticed is, uh, the other two things I've noticed is they call them different things over time. Now they're called assessment visits. They used to be called audits. So 
um, again, I guess uh, trying to make a more gentle law, uh, um, create a more gentle impression. So some of the things that they um, that they will look for is again compliance with the most favorite customer discount um, as we, that we talked about in slide one. Uh, a really big thing that, and this is where I come back to, I this is my second point. The other thing is they have different focuses over different periods of time. I noticed, so they seem to hit some things harder uh, at certain time periods than others. I don't know if they're seeing more non-compliance. So recently, and in recent years, I've, I've seen more personnel uh, meeting the labor category requirements in terms of years of experience and education. That that is really a um, a big deal to them. And again, of course, there's you know there's penalties if you say that someone meets a certain labor category requirement and you're billing at that at that um, rate, and then it comes out that they actually don't meet that requirement. Um, and um, what my suggestion is is to keep some sort of tracking system where you track the candidates, you track what each person on a specific contract, um, and you can do this for all your contracts. It doesn't necessarily need to be GSA, and you will get, you know, you may get requests for this on other contracts other than GSA. But to show that you have, um, that you have the person and you have the resume and you're checking to make sure that they meet the requirements that is in your GSA schedule. And um, just an overall statement is, you know, the government loves processes. So the more that you can show that you're organized, you have a system in place, you have processes in place, you know, they're gonna question you a little bit less and the assessment visit may go a little bit easier. Um, quarterly IFF values um, calculated correctly and paid on time. So they'll run a report, um, generally a lot of times, uh, even ahead of time and to check to see if and when you are paying your industrial funding fee. Then the other part of that is that you are paying it, again, this goes back to setting up your accounting system and your invoices correctly, that you are including all contracts that need to be included. Uh, so that's key. They wanna ensure that you are meeting your minimum contract sales. Uh, they've, um, in recent years or a few years ago, they were discovering, you know, a lot of people had contracts, but there were no sales on them. And that's just administrative work where they're not collecting money if there are no sales. So uh, the sales, um, so the sales requirement after the first two years, we give two years to get 25,000. And then each year after that, you need to have a minimum of twenty-five thousand dollars as well. So it is important that your, you know, sales team is hitting that and tracking that. Um, as we talked about before, lack of preparation, you know, is is going to be an issue and so forth. So again, um, and I don't really believe in. Uh, I believe in proactively planning on contract and on the GSA schedule and having systems and processes in place because it really will make your life a lot easier. Um, and again, the more they find one issue, they might then start to look at other issues. So um, again, you want to make it as easy and pain-free pain as possible. Um, and we actually, going back to the personnel and the uh, labor category requirements, um, we have a tracking sheet, it's in, in Excel uh, that we've developed over time that is quite effective. And if anybody would like a copy, if they wanna just send me an email, I will, either I or my office manager, will send you out our, uh, our compliance matrix, what we call it, the candidate, staffing compliance matrix. So, and it's pretty easy to use. It's pretty simple. 
but it does the job. It has the information that you will need for GSA as well as for other uh, contracts as well. Um, one and and actually in working with a client and using this tool, um, they had wanted to add a person um, to their uh, to the contract that did not meet the labor category qualifications. And it's like, you know, as the company's contracts department, we said, you know, well, um, we can't do this. The requirement was 10 years of experience and the person um, was much, uh, had much less experience. So it's like, okay, what labor category can that person fit in? So again, we went through and, you know, checked it out, but that was um, a time when, you know, this was helpful and again, you know, prevented the company from having fines and penalties in the future. So um, I want to thank everybody for their time. I know contracts, um, to those of you who are not contract people, can seem a, lot of dry, a little dry. We love it. Um, we are part of NCMA. Uh, National Contracts Management Association. And again, I will take uh, questions if anybody has sent them in to Jennifer. Um, and again, want to offer anybody, if you want to have a 30 minute consultation, if you just want to ask some contract questions, uh, there's no obligation. We love talking contracts and happy to do that. Um, so I will um, turn it back to Jennifer. Great, thanks. Anybody that has any questions for Karen, please type them into the panel here on the um, right-hand side of your screen, and I'll read them off. They are anonymous, uh, and we'll read them off in the order that they came in. Um, great presentation today, Karen, very succinct, and uh, all. I think you hit a good uh, chunk of the acronyms and GSA schedule compliance. I feel like there should be a little song or a little ditty about them. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, and let's see here. Uh, when should I start the compliance process? Before I get the schedule, after, uh, how do I know what to include in the compliance checklist? Okay, so a couple questions there. So again, back to setting it up and your most favorite customer, I would say you want to start the compliance um, process as you're working on your proposal and as you're, you know, getting the information together. Of course, there's going to be different things that you're going to do after you get your GSA award, but there are certain things, again, for example, your most favorite customer that you want to set up <coughs> as you're working on the proposal. And I'm sorry, Jennifer, can you repeat some of those other questions? Sure. At what point to start the compliance process and what to include on the checklist? Okay, so that is a um, a, a lengthier answer. Uh, it, you know, it's going to depend whether you do services or products, what what services you offer. If there is SCA, if there's wage determination. Um, so if you want to contact me separately, I would be happy to kind of talk about what your company does and just to give you some ideas um, through that. Uh, so that's um, so again that's that's going to kind of depend on what you're selling to the government. Great. Okay. Uh, and is there a software program for compliance and calculating the industrial funding fee? Um, personally, I don't use any of the contract software. I like I do love Excel. I find um, I have not found. So the answer is. Uh, to my knowledge, definitely not on the IFS, and I have not found, um, and then what was the other one that you were asking about? Uh, is the there a software, software program for compliance and calculating oh. the IFF fee? Um, uh, no, not that I am aware of. Again, um, I'm happy to have a half an hour consultation to give you some ideas and so forth, um, but uh, um, and just in general, I have not found any contract management software that I really like. I've seen, uh, I'm sure I haven't seen everything, but I've seen a lot of them. But I'm not even any, I'm not aware of any that have um, software specific to GSA for the IFF and or um, compliance for it. 
Great. And again, the IFF is the industrial funding fee. It equates to 0.75% of your GSA schedule sales. It's really a wash because the, the customer pays it and then you pay it back to GSA. Um, next question is, uh, how much should I budget for compliance on an annual basis? Um, yeah, I mean, that really depends. Um, it depends whether you're talking about GSA or all of your contracts, because, um, you know, if you're working with the federal government, that is all contracts. It depends whether, um, you know, the type of contracts you have. Obviously, firm fixed price is a lot um, easier to manage than something like cost plus fixed fee or, you know, and time and materials is generally in the middle. So, and it's, you know, that there's just too many variables for me to really give you a good answer. I will say that, um, and I know, I, you know I'm kind of promoting Streamline here, but I find that most people don't need a full-time contract person unless they get to about the $20 million market or $20 million point. That's usually the time period when it's going to be more cost-effective to hire somebody full-time and bring somebody in house. Great. That's good to know. So I, I, Great. And I, I think it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's helpful. And I think it's um, just a, a good question in general, because uh, there is a cost of doing business with GSA. It's not like you're just getting the schedule and suddenly your phone's going to ring off the hook. Um, obviously, the large majority of uh, vendors have zero sales through their schedule. Um, and you still have to report even if you're not doing any business. And it's, you know, that's why it can be potentially a, a liability and it's not for everybody. Um, but yeah, Streamline is there to help um, provide the uh, the compliance component of the uh, of the GSA schedule and, and contracts in in general. Um, what we will do with the um, conclusion, which is uh, in moments away, uh, when we send the slides out, we'll provide uh, Karen, Archiza, and Jim's email address. That way, if you guys uh, want to contact them for additional information for the matrix that. Uh, Karen spoke of, um, or if you want to do a trial to the GovSpend uh, FedMind platform for data, set up a meeting with Jim to talk about marketing, uh, talk to us uh, in regards to getting onto the schedule. Uh, we're happy to uh, have those conversations and, um, and work with everybody. Again, just a friendly reminder, Monday, December 12th is our holiday soiree uh, with nine government entities. A good chunk from DOD, um, and our sponsors do include Amazon, First National Bank, Bid Speed, Proposal Helper, Spartan Shield, Shaletta, and others. Um, so again, Karen, thank you for presenting and wrapping up uh, today's webinar, uh, batting at the the cleanup um, spot. I think they say in baseball. So <laughs> excellent job. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, for having me. I really appreciate it. Great. Okay. And again, the today's webinar, uh, the slides we're going to email out to anyone that registered. If you did not uh, register, then you're probably hearing this on our YouTube channel. And the slides are on slideshare.net. The recording will be on our YouTube channel. It gives a couple hours to uh, convert everything and, um, and publish it. So thanks again. And this concludes our webinar. I'm going to um, close here with these last few slides that do have everybody's contact information. Again, you will get the slides in an email. Um, and we appreciate everybody that uh, stuck with us for the duration here of three hours. And um, hopefully you found this useful. So thanks again, everybody.